Well, I think we'll get started. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here. I'm Barbara Epstein. I'm Director of the Health Sciences Library System. And we're very happy to welcome you to a new year or a returning year. Um, today's lecture is presented in conjunction with the National Library of Medicine exhibit on, it's titled, Graphic Medicine, Ill-Conceived and Well-Drawn. And this is currently on display in Falk Library. The exhibit focuses on the power of visual storytelling in medical education, describing how comics can uniquely portray narratives of illness and health. And our speaker, Dr. Jay Hosler, is an award-winning educator and cartoonist. He has extensive experience in using comics in biology education. Dr. Hosler earned his PhD in biological sciences from the University of Notre Dame. And he joined the faculty of Juniata College and is currently the chair of the biology department. He's also a nationally recognized cartoonist and the author of many science comics and graphic novels. A 20, 2006 grant from the National Science Foundation made it possible for Dr. Hosler to develop a comic book textbook titled Optical Illusions. His latest book is Evolution, the Story of Life on Earth, and that was a 20, 2011 Junior Literary, Literary Guild Junior Library Guild selection. Library Guild? Library Guild selection. In his search to effectively engage learners, he has found that comics are capable of delivering information in a way that traditional textbooks can't. And today he will describe how comics and why comics appeal to our minds and how this is a, an aid in learning. If you would like to learn more about the narrative power of comics after this talk, I invite you to visit the Graphic Medicine exhibit in Falk Library on the second floor, and it will be here through the end of September. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Hassel. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? I am happy to have provided an excuse for free food for everyone. Uh, it's good. Uh, it's all downhill from here. Um, so uh, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, essentially why, why you should be interested in comics at all. Um, I'm going to break it down into a, uh, three parts. The first is going to talk about why comics have traditionally had a bad rap in the United States. Um, so a little bit of history. Uh, then I want to talk about how images and stories can be employed uh, in various ways. And then finally, what happens, what sort of bizarre alchemy starts to take place when we put the pictures and the images and the stories together. All right? So that's our roadmap for the day. Um, we start with um, what I thought was funny, but I didn't really hear much laughing, so I must have been wrong. Uh, <laughs> This notion that um, words and pictures together are for stupid people. All right. Now, this is not a, sort of a made-up idea. It, for Juniata, about 10 years ago, they're like they got this great idea, which was to generate an ad for Juniata that was in cartoon form that they would place into high school newspapers. So it looked like a comic that you would read, and then boom, you're hit by an ad. Right. So surreptitiously kind of sucking you in. And they did a um, focus group. So I did this strip. It was two panels, you know, two, page, uh, two tiers long, several panels. And then they did a focus group. And the high school students were unambiguous <coughs> that this sent the message that this was not a serious place. That only a dumb person who doesn't like to read books would go to some place that advertises using our cartoon. And so this is not only a prevalent idea, but deeply entrenched in relatively young people. Now, this is in a society, of course, that loves the comics page. So I've worked for a number of newspapers. And if there is one page that you cannot print, it's the comics page. Because everyone has to have their daily high and lowest. Right? Or Hagar the Horrible, because we have to know what pedantic, crazy, dumb, banal thing Hagar got into today. Right? So there's this strange dichotomy 
We love them, but we don't think they're good for us. It's like candy. I'm going to make an argument against that. There used to be a good old days of comics, right? So this is used at U.S. Comic Book Readership in 1945. Six to 11 years old, uh, virtually all males and females are reading comics to some level. Um, even 18 to 30, look at that, 41% of men are reading them. 28% of women, okay, that is a demographic that I'm sure most comic book shops today would love to capture because they're mostly boy shops, unfortunately. And at the time, uh, forgive me for being a biologist for a second, there was this tremendous biodiversity, comico diversity, right? Um, there were comics about superheroes, but there were funny animals, and there were classic illustrated romance crime, weird science, a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, it was so prevalent in terms of kid culture that there were actually researchers back then that were thinking, you know, educational researchers, like, maybe we should use these in classes. Uh, and there were a number of studies by Hutchinson and Sonos that took comics, they partnered with a teacher, the teacher built a lesson around that comic, right? And then they assessed student outcomes. One of my favorite uh, bits of feedback from a teacher in one of those was that the comics made learning too easy. <laughs> As an instructor, I'm like, whoa, that blows my mind. It was just too easy. It's like saying in bioinformatics, yes, I could use high throughput sequencing, but it just makes the actual analysis so much easy, too easy. I really want my slide rule and my abacus, then I feel like I've done science. Um, one teacher built an entire week around a comic, and they were done in a day because the kids actually did the reading. Right? That's a pretty compelling, powerful mechanism. Uh, so what happened? Uh, well, as we know, we live in a, this is a, as a, a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat, it was really very sad to see a Democrat making this ad, but uh, she was, Nancy King was running, uh, worried about uh, uh, teachers being laid off in her district. Imagine if they had to lay off teachers and a bunch of kids are reading comics. Yes, imagine if they had to lay off teachers and suddenly kids went home and read. <laughs> How horrible that would be, my gosh. Uh, uh, that's clearly not the implication. The implication is that they're reading stuff that's going to make them dumber. Um, I will actually uh, tell you about experiments we've done in our lab that indicate that comics do not, in fact, make you dumber. Um, how do we get from using them in classes and wow, they're the greatest, to they make you dumber, please elect me so we don't lay off teachers? Um, 50s, there was a book by uh, a sociologist named Frederick Wortham called The Seduction of the Innocent, and uh, without too much evidence, laid the fault of all juvenile delinquency at the feet of comics, violent comics, etc., etc. Right? Um, how powerful was his book? Well, there were hearings uh, and book burnings. That's right. Less than a decade after Nazis were burning books in Germany, uh, U.S. citizens were burning comics in the U.S. If we got uh, Binghamton, New York, students of St. Patrick's Parochial School collected 2,000 of objectionable comics. In a house-to-house -house kindness, that just sounds terrifying, you know, <laughs> kids roaming the street, grabbing my comics, and making nervous, uh, and then burn them in the schoolyard. So not just burning them. But burning them in a site of an educational purpose. All right? That's pretty terrifying. Um, Britain banned U.S. comics. I love this photo of this British kid who's apparently just broken in. <laughs> <laughs> and he must have like a long elastic arm because he's broken these high windows and like reached in somehow, got comics, and then you know the, the dumb expression indicates that he is really stupid because he steals them and then stands there and reads them. Uh, British banned them. The U.S. Uh, adopted a self-censorship. So the comics that persisted um, worked under the, the Comics Code Authority for several years after that. 
I mean, up until the 1970s, uh, late 70s, when Stan Lee wanted to do a story about Peter Parker's friend, Harry Osborne, dealing with drugs, which drugs were not permitted, even if they were to be shown as bad under the Comics Code. And so Stan Lee published, I think it was number 96, The Amazing Spider-Man, published that without the Comics Code. Uh, Dell Comics didn't adopt the, the Comics Code, they just completely neutered all of their comics. So they're, they're completely, absolutely scrubbed clean of anything that could even be violated. <coughs> so in the 50s, it was as if the world of comics exploded and there was only one surviving genre. That's Krypton for those of you who are not in the genre of superheroes. <laughs> I'm like the necklace of your dots. Uh, uh, so suddenly we have comics like this as the only option. And that in many ways defined comics for a generation, more than a generation. So we have an episode here of Rainbow Batman. He had to had to put on a different rainbow or a different colored costume every day. I've never actually read the count. I don't know why. But there was probably some Byzantine reason for it. And then here is Superman who's any swift movie then turned into a lion. And now he and Lois must act out a modern version of Beauty and the Beast. Right? This was, the episode, this was the era in which we had Superman who could shoot little, one of his powers was shooting mini Superman from his fingertips to go battle small. <coughs> right? This is why so many people frame comics as something that would just make, that's not worth your time. Right? Um, the problem is that what that does is confuse genre with medium. Right? So it would be like saying, because slasher films exist, movies are a bad thing. Or because uh, bad novels exist, all books are bad. Right? Um, <clears throat> Herbie Picard, who has probably worked our cancer year in the, uh, the graphic novel, uh, graphic medicine catalog, once said that comics are just words and pictures. You can do anything. I think that's a pretty liberating sentiment. Um, there's another smart person, Gene Owen with Yang. Um, Yang's first book was called American Born Chinese, and it detailed the experiences of a young kid who was first child of uh, Chinese immigrants and his experience uh, as an immigrant in the United States. Right? He has gone on do a number of, of interesting books. Uh, he was a computer, former computer science teacher, so one of his, a couple of his books are about actual programming. But he also got the MacArthur <coughs> Genius Award. All right? So he's a pretty bright guy. I'm just giving his resume so you believe me when I tell you what he said. Um, one of the things that Yang talks about is being, well, he talks about several things in terms of why comics are compelling. I'm going to focus on three. Um, the first is that they act as an intermediate, right? So uh, they can be a less complicated way to explain something that allows you to get your foot in the door on a concept, right? So this actually, this idea of intermediacy uh, was the underlying uh, idea of guiding sort of my, my comic book textbook. We'll talk about that later, but the basic idea was that I would have this character, Wrinkles the Wonder Brain, he works for the Gray sisters passing their eyeball around, and they, the Gray sisters aren't witches, they're scientists, and he is moving the eyeball around the lab and trips and falls into a vat of distilled human imagination, and then goes on to have a series of eye-related adventures. Right? So this was a book for my sensory biology class. And what it is, is it has like uh, an eight-page comic story, so like the very first chapter is about natural selection of the eye. And then it's immediately followed by um, a short uh, four to six page sort of traditional textbook type of thing. And the idea was I would introduce some of these concepts about the eye in the comic story and then allow the kids to start reading the text portions, 
having a little bit of background, a little bit of visual context, right? So that's the intermediary. They're visual. Uh, we are visual monkeys. And they're permanent. And this actually, I don't think, can be underscored enough, especially if you're trying to convey an idea, whether it's, you know, um, hygiene lessons it provided to folks in the third world are oftentimes done with sequential images without words because you can sit there and, and gather and garner what's going on. The idea of permanence is this, is that I control the rate at which I move through the material. Okay, So you say, well, a video is also sequential images. That's true. They're all projected at the same point, and the film projector moves them for you. Okay? Unless you've got the pause button right there, uh, your control is limited. Whereas if you are learning um, English as a second language, for example, right? comics are really, really valuable for English as a second language. In fact, more and more language books are starting to incorporate small comic scripts, and pages of scripts for this very reason. They provide context cues. You can go at your own speed, right? So these three basic ideas are going to sort of form the foundation for some of the ideas that we'll talk about in a little bit. So let's, uh, I'm in a medical school, so we'll do a dissection, right? I'm not a real doctor. So the things I dissect never actually get back up again. But let's hope for the best on this talk, because I don't leave it on the slab. So let's talk about pictures. Uh, they are the original data storage. Uh, so here are honey collectors, uh, cliff honey collectors. Um, doing their thing in the modern day, and there are the honey collectors doing the same exact thing 6,000 years ago. Some might use of pictures to communicate 27,000 years prior to actual written language. That suggests priority. A bit of primacy. Um, if we do a little experiment, I'm going to show you, show you something. I want you to read it. As soon as you sort of figured out what it is, I want you to shout it out. All right? Actually, I'm going to time it because this is science. And I have, I have the computing power greater than the Apollo 11 on my, in my hand, so I'm going to use the stopwatch. <laughs> right? All right, so I'm going I'm to do this simultaneously. I'm going to move it. Here we go. Ready? Four seconds. Would it have taken it 9.4 seconds if I just showed you the picture? This is where even if it would, you would go, no. Well, it would not. I would have known immediately that was a cog or gear. Um, the difference here is the difference between perceived information and received information. So perceived information, right? Uh, on the left, I my brain. This is what your brain is doing. It's really fast at it, 9.46 seconds fast at it. But it's got to look at that and say, well, okay, that's an upside down TV with a crossbar. Okay, that's an A. Oh, there's a space after it. Okay, that's A by itself, so it's not part of another word. It's just the letter A. A, that's the first word. And then I hit the wheel, right? And my brain is rapidly decoding, perceiving all of that information. Not only that, I have to figure out what wheel is, but I have to remember or realize what wheel is in conjunction with bar and series of projections of LLL, right? On the right is received information. And your brains are terrific at accessing images very, very, very quickly. By some estimates, you can zip through 50,000 images in your memory in seconds. Uh, one of my favorite studies on this was they uh, put subjects in front of a computer screen, and then they just blast it at super high speed, a thousand images in about two or three seconds. So really fast, right? And then they presented uh, the subjects with 2,000 images. So they would go through and say, this was in the blast, this was in the blast. And under those conditions, uh, subjects got about 90, 95% correct. That's, that's like ESP level weird. Right? That we are capable of not only seeing, recording, and recognizing that. But if you think about 
our natural history, you can start to imagine why vision was so important. Vision was the difference between judging or misjudging that limb over there. And do I make it across, or am I jungle floor people, right? Uh, do I judge how close the tiger is correctly or not? Right? All of those things become vitally important, and we still uh, rely upon them. If we thought, start now thinking about not just images as you know, important things that we like, but if we start thinking in terms of uh, scientific explanations. Darwin's tree was, I mean, it doesn't look like much, does it? This was a little sketch in what was what he called his transmutation notebooks, as people were sort of calling it, natural selection evolution. That was the first time that any scientist had visualized evolution as a tree, right? Now the truth is the idea of a family tree was an old one, right? You can, you can uh, Google online these amazing, ornate Victorian oak trees that have uh, little curios and faces of the people from the tree. Right? The idea of a tree, right, representing a family was not new. But the idea of saying, hey, maybe all life on Earth since in the same big tree that was, was revolutionary. It was a revolutionary visual articulation of what he was talking about. On the right, Santiago Ramon Cajal. Uh, Cajal wanted to be an artist when he was a kid. His dad said, no, you're going to be a doctor. So Cajal figured out how to be both. And then he won the Nobel Prize. It is not an exaggeration to say that the founder of modern neuroscience um, made his mark through his art, through visualization of the nervous system. So this is the rep. Actually, when I teach neuro, I use this image just to make the point of how good he was. So with his images, he was actually able to deduce directional flow, right? suggest particular interactions, maybe even filtering of signals as they went through. So it's very easy, though, to look at that and say, well, no, duh. You have no control, Jay. I mean, you say that pictures are important for science. But maybe we would have just been super smart enough and we wouldn't need no pictures anyway. OK, that is true. I do have one example, though, that I'm going to argue is my control. Gregor Mendel, kind of important guy. He came up with this stuff called Mendelian genetics. Um, it's pretty huge. In fact, he was a contemporary of Darwin's. And Darwin actually went to the grave, I think the quote was, I have convinced the world of evolution, but not of natural selection. He thought he had failed. Because the one thing that he was missing was an explanation for how inheritance worked. Right? All the other pieces he could give you data for, but he had never articulated exactly how these adaptations, these advantageous traits were passed on. Mendel did at the same time. And in fact, in his drawer, he had Mendel's manuscript uh, sealed shut, unopened. Um, biographers will tell you, even if he'd opened them, Darwin wasn't great with numbers. Probably wouldn't quite have understood it. But he had several contemporaries that were great with numbers and could potentially have shared that information. When Mendel, this groundbreaking scientist, presented his work to other scientists, no one understood what he was talking about. And in fact, they, there's actual reports of people thinking how boring it was. Because he focused on what he did, right, and how complicated it was, and everything got lost. What if he had a picture? Now, yes, his work was intense and had tons of data. But my wife is a middle school science teacher, and she teaches Punnett Squares. And I'll tell you what, if some of those kids in her class can grok a Punnett Square, <laughs> I'm pretty sure brainy Victorian scientists could have as well. So it's an imperfect example. But I would argue that Mendel's work was lost until the early 20th century. Uh, maybe didn't have to be. Uh, or maybe it couldn't have worked that way because Punnett wasn't born yet, so he couldn't make this work. <laughs> um, 
All right, so pretty important for conveying information. Let's get personal. This is kind of medically, so you'll like it. Um, doctors working in ER, um, you, know, you have a patient that comes in, big gash in some part of their body. All right, so you're a human being, and you have a hole in you, and it's leaking. That's usually a very compelling, <coughs> I find myself very motivated by giant holes leaking bodily fluids. Makes me want to do something about it. So we've got folks who go to the ER, and uh, uh, docs there decide, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to split them in two groups. Uh, one group, we're going to give written instructions for how to take care of this wound. The other group, we're going to get the exact same instructions, word for word. The only difference is going to be that we put on these silly, poorly drawn images. That's it. Only difference. And then they talked to patients a little bit later. I can't remember how long the way. It was a couple of weeks, I think. And they asked them, you know, some basic questions. Did you read the instructions? So almost everybody did if they were cartoons. Uh, less than 80% did, if there weren't, right? Uh, they were asked four questions about wound care. Again, you're at home, large hole somewhere in your body. Don't want it to get infected because like your right arm. Do something about it. How many answered those four questions correctly? Uh, close to 50% of you in pictures. 6% on wound care for the hole in your body. <laughs> right? How many actually did what the wound care thing said? 77 percent before, and then look what happens with those with less than a high school degree. How many of you adhered to wound care? 82 twice, a little less than twice as many. All they did was put some silly pictures there. Okay? If that is not compelling evidence that you that we, I won't just pick on you, we are silly visual monkeys, right? I don't know what I can do. So that's, that's keeping you well. How about keeping you alive? You get on an airplane, and you open up those airplane instructions, because everyone wants to think about dying right before takeoff. <laughs> and it's not a block of text, right? They made a decision. All right, this is life or death. We're going to use words or pictures. Oh, we're going to use pictures. Because the last thing you want to do when the gas mask drops is get your reading glasses out and wonder, what the hell is this my type? These are comics. And when it's important, that is what you use. Right? Now, before going further, I'm not really advocating getting rid of the written word. Okay, so before anyone rolls their eyes so far back up in their head that you can see your frontal lobes. That is not what I'm advocating. What I'm advocating today is that this is a tool that is underutilized. Right? And that if you have a tool that can make a difference in, in my case, my students' lives, in your case, this eventually your patients' lives, why wouldn't you use it? If I can use comics, and I do, to improve my students' understanding of photosynthesis, which they do, why would I not use that? And if you can use a picture or an image to make sure that someone takes care of the wound that you just stitched up, why wouldn't you do that? Right? Um, why are they so effective? This is the amazing magic of, of cartoons. Here's a cute little Russian girl. This is from Albert Jarvis's Eye Movements and Vision. Jarvis was one of the pioneers on doing eye tracking, so looking at how we look uh, at pictures. And when you show a subject this picture <coughs> and track where their eyes go, you see the lines are, the line is where the eye is moving, and then there are darker spots where the eye sort of pauses for a moment takes a little picture, moves on to another little picture, right? Because, well, I think your fovea, 
uh, takes about 2% of your visual aid uh, area. So your eyes are constantly vibrating, hopefully not quite that chameleon-like, but they're constantly <laughs> moving around, right, piecing together this picture. So at no point am I actually seeing all of you at once. My brain is sort of assembling that. So eyes go all around that. What's this? Is the face? You ever met anybody with this one? <laughs> Probably maybe, maybe in critical care. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no nose. That is not a face. But you see a face. Why do you see a face? I don't know. Maybe because you're crazy little monkeys. And the most important thing to you when you are interacting with another human being are what are their eyes doing? What is their mouth doing? Right? If they've got furrowed brows and a happy face, then what does that mean? Or hap, I can't do it. Right? They're sort of coordinated. We see faces everywhere. I was, as I mentioned, I was out in Vermont talking to some graduate students uh, last week, and I got stuck behind this, I, don't, I can't even remember what the name of the car was, but the back of the car had two taillights, and then its fender was like, bent like this, stylistically. And the, the lights went in like this, and it looked as if the car was scowling at me. <laughs> For like 100 miles on dirt road, I mean, two lane road, I'm like, why did the car bad at me? You know? It was so uncomfortable. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna turn my lights on. Are they on my brights on? Um, we see these things everywhere. So in other words, I don't even have to draw anything fancy to make you think that's human. Uh, XKCD, anybody familiar with that comic strip? Okay, XKCD, essentially stick figures. If you look it up, it's pretty funny stuff. Um, he doesn't even draw faces. He's a super popular web cartoonist. Uh, his characters don't have faces. Right? And more people have read his stuff than mine. That's for absolutely <laughs> sure. <laughs> I put all this time into faces. What am I doing? I'm wasting my time. Um, so we see faces everywhere. Comics sort of cash in on that from an iconic standpoint. They don't have to be complicated to be effective. And in fact, when students come to my office confused by my lecture, which happens more often than I'd like, um, you know, I sit there and draw pictures for them, their own very individual pictures for them. And I always think they're not going to want this. And I'm like, they're going to do it. And I see later they've taped it into their thing, and they, they make it, and they've drawn it. So there's a desire for this. Uh, in terms of explanations. All right, another quiz. This is Ringles the Wonder Brain. What's he doing? Jumping. It sure seems like he's jumping, right? But in reality, I have one panel in which he's squatting. So you may have to go back. Maybe he just one because he's happy. Another one, he's in the air somehow, but you never actually see him jump. Who made him jump? You did. You took the first picture, and you took the second picture, and you intuited the story. All right? That's a pretty active way to engage with material. Whereas, if again, if I did an animated bit of wrinkles jumping, you would just sit there and passively see, well, oh, wrinkle jump. Um, <clears throat> This work hasn't been done, but I keep telling a couple friends of mine that do uh, images, we got to teach rats how to read comics so that they can put electrodes into their brains because they don't let us do it to humans. I keep trying to recruit students. They don't seem to be very excited about it. When you have that activity, right, it's like a synapse. Uh, I got a presynaptic cell, or I got a postsynaptic cell doing something, and there's an intermediary there which in a synapse is a neurotransmitter, but in comics it's your brain, right? So you are actively engaged in the story in a way that may not be otherwise. That's a pretty powerful tool too. Again, going back to the airline instructions. The belt buckles apart, then the belt buckles together. You don't ever actually see it happen, but you're like, oh, that's what I gotta do. So I can buckle myself in as we head into this mountain. Uh, my mother was very, very sensible about seatbelts in general. Um, okay, what happens then? So there's, there's my argument for pictures. 
What happens when we start putting words with them? Um, nothing like a slide of text to bring everything to a screeching halt. Don't read the whole thing. The, this is a, um, from a review of my book, Evolution. And it was by a science librarian, and it's one of my favorite observations about science comics. All right? Blah, 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 blah. And here it is. The producers, so there are two types of comics, science comics. And I think this applies to anything. This applies to history comics, it applies to comics comics, nonfiction comics, uh, graphic medicine comics, whatever. Two types. Uh, there are those in which the producers think that anything in graphic novel format will be, by definition, more interesting and engaging than something that's purely text-based. So in other words, they've taken densely, um, a dense text, and they made it a densely illustrated text. Okay, so I will speak from personal experience. When I was growing up, I loved Spider-Man. I loved uh, Peanuts, those were the things I liked. But, you know, well-meaning adults would say, oh, this is a comic on the, you know, the Apollo rocket, right? Which you would think kind of would be intrinsically interesting. But somehow, the physicists who wrote it managed to wring every bit of joy out of the notion of putting a human in a missile and shooting them at another planet, and then somehow bouncing off the planet and getting back to Earth. All of the excitement of that one reduced to technical box of text that just happened to have pictures together. And I wanted nothing to do with those things. Right? Those are the kind of comics that parents think their kids will like. And wow, those are the kind of comics that parents like. Well, it's comics, and it's educational. Let's give it to the kids. They'll love it. They don't. They hate it. Uh, <laughs> the other type of science graphic novel is one that reimagines how scientific knowledge can be presented. Right? And that, that is what I'm interested in. <clears throat> there are, so I speak from the standpoint of uh, an instructor at a small liberal arts college. There are glorious array of richly illustrated textbooks from which I usually pick one based on how good the images are oftentimes. That is the core source of our material. Right? That's their touchstone. Um, but that is just one tool, one mechanism, right? We also do case studies. And I have them read comics. And I have them make comics. The best thing that I've ever done is an activity in which I say, OK, here's this famous experiment. I want you to draw a comic without words that outlines the protocol that they use. Right? It lends itself really well. Protocols tend to be step by step. Now you pick the right experiment, you can fit the back one. And when I do that, and I, this is an experiment that's ongoing, when I do that, the kids who draw it um, do better than the kids who write about it. They just did. Right? And there's actually all of this evidence, well, not all of this evidence, there's a growing body of evidence uh, for drawing to learn as a mechanism. And if you think about what it requires, what drawing requires, what do I have to do? Um, I have to look at a situation. Uh, and I'm, am I going to render it like a Rembrandt? Right? No, I'm going to cartoon it up. All right, you're going to cartoon it up. What details go into that cartoon? Right? I'm, I'm drawing a face. Look at all these glorious faces. Right? I'm going to draw a circle. Ain't nobody in this room has a perfectly circular head, but that is the detail. That's come up. Make a little bump for a nose. Make two dots for an eyes and a smile. Maybe some hair. In some cases not. Right? And so that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to decide which elements of the image are important. What do I have to have for the communication? Well, that's a processing issue. And to do that, you have to know what's going on in order to make those decisions. Do I draw a picture of the pipette? Is that necessary? Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Right? And so all of a sudden, you have to start sorting information based upon what's important to show and what don't I need to show. And again, you can't do that unless you develop an understanding of what's going on. Right? Uh, this, is, uh, this is a first page of a two-page comic I did for, uh, I was commissioned by a woman named Adrienne Briscoe. Uh, 
for her paper in Plops about, and she did biochromatics of this butterfly. And apparently, uh, females have extra taste receptors in their foreleg here. So you see little fuzzy things in her foreleg. And they go around, um, <coughs> touch your plants to see if that plant is toxic or not, because they have to lay their babies on it, right? Um, and she's looking for cyogenic light size. The male can't do this. Right? So what I did in the story was, it's sort of a breakup story. I picked my favorite uh, 1980s romantic, Tracy and, or Stacy and Travis. Uh, and Travis is no, no help to her at all. Okay? Uh, so, because uh, she's looking for it, and she asked him what he thinks about this. And, you know, it's, I like it, it's green, it's planty. Um, <clears throat> so, we'll get back to this in a little bit. But telling a story in this, I had two pages. The, the actual science uh, is probably, you could probably say it's in two of the, there's four, five, six, probably a total of 12, two of the 12 panels actually have science in them. I mean, this is one of the downsides, right? You say, I'm going to use comics. If you, if you do it the way I think they should be done, then you have to give up some space for explanation, but replace it potentially for contextual information that will help someone remember it. Tell stories. I'm doing on time. We have, what, till three? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> if I'm a quarter of the way through, I think we're going to make it. Um, tell stories. Uh, Jake Pernowski. The symbol of the metaphor or is necessary to use science as to poetry. That is, that is an astonishing claim by Pernowski. Wow. Symbol and metaphor in cold objective science? We all know that scientists don't feel anything. We're robots. We go in the lab, we open up the manual to the next experiment we're supposed to do, we robotically perform it, we generate data that always works. We do not ever have theories that we violently defend, right? <laughs> we are not emotional. So how could this be important? Um, <clears throat> telling stories provides context, right? So my argument is if pictures are important and stories tell context, let's put them together. Has anybody smart done that? A couple smart people. So when Einstein published his special theory of relativity, he told a story, which I'll tell you in a second, and drew a picture, which is the top thing. It's not super exciting. Let me break it down for you. Um, this upper line that bends up is a train. So for my eyes, as a kid who grew up loving locomotives with cow catchers, this train looks like it's upside down. Um, but anyway, it's a train. V indicates velocity, so it's moving this way. Here's the rail, and on this, this is the side of the train. And in this particular case, he's got someone standing on the embankment and someone riding on the train. And then what he posits is that lightning strikes. And it strikes at A and it strikes at B. Okay? Now, this is his story. Some woman is standing by the side of the track, and some man is, or some woman is in the train, and they're going by, and they're both going to experience this phenomenon. So everyone can imagine train standing, watching, going. Then lightning. Now, he used this story, this analogy, to settle an argument that had raged since Leibniz, right? Before he made calculus. Uh, which was, is time absolute in the universe? Is it the same time on Saturn as it is here? That's an oversimplification. But that's essentially the idea. Anywhere in the universe, we're all at the same time. Um, or is it relative? Can it be perceived differently? And so using this example, now I have uh, taken or bastardized a picture by one of my friends, Troy Cummings, and I put my character wrinkles on it. The, the basic idea is this. We've got wrinkles standing, watching the train, <clears throat> another wrinkles on the train. Now lightning strikes, ka <clears throat> All right? Now let's look at it from the perspective of embankment wrinkles. Okay? 
He looks, his peripheral vision says, those two lightning strikes happen simultaneously. Right? But let's consider Brinkle's Prime. He's sitting here on the train and sitting by, and the light from this lightning bolt gets to his eyes just a little bit before this one. And Brinkle's Prime says, not simultaneous. B was before A. That's how we explain this gigantic idea. That's pretty compelling. Um, this is my hero, Cajal. Um, Cajal discovered the growth cone. He looked at the growth of nerves and brains way early on. And I can't help but see, when I see images in sequence, a story, right? There's a nerve, and it grew, and it grew, and then it hit puberty, and things started sprouting all over the place. Right? It's a story. It's almost impossible not to see it as a story. But if we put those words and pictures together, a researcher named Mayer um, has shown that when you combine words, descriptions, and images together, that kids retain information much better than either of those things by themselves. Right? It's a testable hypothesis that I'm putting forward that comics can actually help you learn, and may actually in some cases help you learn better. This is Optical Illusions. There's a page of the comic. There's a page of what the traditional text was like. Um, we published, we studied this particular uh, book in class. I used it for non-majors and majors. Uh, I, I assessed their attitudes about comics and biology beforehand, and then their understanding of the content that was going to be in the book before we used the book. And then I made the same tests at the end. Okay? Uh, and what I was really interested in is not the majors so much, because they, ceiling effect, right? They already knew a lot of the science beforehand, although they did wind up going on afterwards. It was the non-majors that I was interested in. The kids who get, who grab, I walk into class sometimes, they're grabbing the desk as if the room is about to fly off of campus because they have to take this class. They started, in terms of their content knowledge, in the D range. Um, their attitude of biology was very low. It was an awful icky thing. And they're Biology, right? Um, <laughs> and their their interest in their their opinion of comics was also <clears throat> stupendously low. And then we used the book for two weeks. I waited two weeks after that, gave them the tests again. Their content scores were now at about the B plus level, right? Um, but what was really cool is their opinion of biology it shot way up, and it was correlated with an increased opinion of comics. So it's just but there are actually a whole bunch of studies that have followed that from other labs that have shown exactly the same thing. Kids that are given comics that explain viruses are more likely to reread that comic on their own than the kids in another class who get the same information in basic text form. Now, for me, from an instructor's standpoint, or maybe from a physician's standpoint who wants someone to follow those wound instructions, the idea of rereading something is pretty valuable. Right? So, not only testable hypothesis, but we did it. <clears throat> now, this is the vision. It was recently killed and boo hoo hoo. Uh, this is a big moment in 1970s comic. I think Steve Englehart wrote this comic in which the vision, something bad happens, I can't remember what it is, but this android cries. He felt something. Very data slash stock kind of thing, right? Um, the facts aren't enough. There I said. And I think the argument that, you know, if I give you instructions on wound care, you don't really follow it, really argues pretty strongly that the facts, regardless of how important we think they are, are just not enough. What is enough? Well, feeling something. That's pretty important. We, and I work with a bunch of scientists, we really do think emotion is the enemy sometimes. Right? You do. Don't, don't want to feel anything. Right? That, that anything, any kind of emotional content gets in the way of, of what you're really trying to teach. But the truth is, uh, if 
fine laughing in class. There's a lot of neurobiology that says those, that endorphin release triggers memory formation, right? Pleasant associations, willingness to go to class again, <laughs> which is always pretty important. Uh, so emotion is not a trivial thing to consider, right? Uh, Stephen Jay Gould quote that I really like, we cannot win this battle to save species and environments while forging an emotional bond between ourselves and nature as well, for we will not fight to save that which we do not love. I think to me that summarizes the best. You want to change the world, you got to love it. You can't be interested in it abstractly. <laughs> you could, but it's really not going to do a whole lot. My kids right now feel sort of powerless. They have an existential dread about everything. I didn't do it to them, because uh, uh, I'm fully medicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, woo, sounds pretty. Look out. Uh, no, it's not quite that bad. But they feel powerless. They can't do anything, because they love nature. But So how do we do that? We need context. Stories provide context. You need characters that you care about. That's why you go back and reread something. If you don't like a character, you're not going to reread something. If you don't think something's funny, you're not going to reread something. All right? That's what I want my kids to do. I want them to reread. Uh, and I think being funny, that's the best way to do it. That's personal opinion. So I have this uh, comic that I've done. This is all part of like a 22-page comic. I have these two characters, Wilbur and Edna. Uh, they're named after characters that my dad uh, created for me when I was a kid. Wilbur is an impetuous little fly. Aunt Edna is the wise, observant ant. Um, and so here we are talking about all the energy trapped in the glucose molecule, right? And there are two ways to release that. Cellular respiration releases it slowly and drips and drabs so that we don't blow up, right? But you can actually light sugar on fire. Who burns? It's a really inefficient loss of that energy. So to drive that point home, I have, I have uh, Wilbur who's decided he needs some energy. He's going to break this glucose molecule. He's been warned not to do it this way. He's taking a big old hammer to it. And of course, he smashes it, it blows up, whoosh. There's something just intrinsically to me funny about someone catching on fire. <laughs> and then there's a, there's a sort of huh, sigh, and then I told you so. Now, one of the things I love is like, I, with comics, I can just stick things in. Like, I don't know, the three, or six CO2 produced by this. Right? Those are little things that reward rereading. I use this for my class. We get to, uh, to cellular respiration. Uh, my kids are, tend to be, for whatever reason, terrified of me, so they don't ever tell me this in person. But in addition to the negative comments sometimes in my teaching evaluations, there are plastic ones <laughs> in which they unsolicitedly say, thank God for the comics. <laughs> because that's the one format that you can actually be understanding. Um, I think it's intrinsically funny, and I would want to watch, as a kid, I would want to read this again. I'd want to watch it again. I, there's something funny about that thing blowing up in its face, because you know what's happening from the first time. Um, <clears throat> the ne next thing about story uh, that you have to keep in mind, I think is useful, is the concept of the mirror. Right? Um, this, was, this was driven home for me for, by a young adult librarian. She said, look, the best YA which is really essentially what my target audience is, middle schoolers, uh, high school kids. The best YA stories have two things. The first is a mirror, right? And you can use this and apply this to any sort of description that you use. Um, if I write a story about honeybees, well, what's the mirror there? The mirror is that uh, they're a big family living together. They have to all go out to eat every once in a while, or someone has to go to the store and get some nectar and pollen, bring it back, right? They have to live together. Sometimes there's conflict in the hive, right? The males sit around and do nothing but reproduce. They have to be fed by the females, right? Things that we can really relate to. Um, half the room thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's also a window that you have to show people. And so in medicine, you have these windows into bizarre worlds that we have no idea about. I, I'm listening to Terry Pratchett's, uh, one of the Discworld stories, and they're ridiculous and silly. And, and this particular one, 
for whatever reason, a wizard has come back from the dead, right? And he's re-inhabited his body. Uh, but now he's in charge of all autonomic function. And at one point he's going, my God, my spleen. It's been ticking away for 130 years doing something. I have no idea what it does. He doesn't know how to work his spleen, right? Um, giving us insights into what a spleen does. For me, it's much more interesting to poke around in a beehive and say, look, this is a, it's a place that mommy lays an egg in a big chamber made of wax. And then your sisters come up and spit food on you. Uh, and if they hold back some food, you might grow up to be a queen. But usually, uh, the food they give you is just going to make you grow up to be completely new, right? And, um, and then when we, you grow up, maybe you're gonna, we're going to go and make a new hive. Um, you're going to secrete wax, bodily secretions to use that. I want you to imagine as a newlywed. Hey, let's get a house. Okay, well, let's start saving up. Right? You have that, you have that earwax jar, right? That you have to... <laughs> That's a weird world. There are so many weird worlds on our planet. There are weird worlds inside us. Um, and so, when you tell stories, the ability to give a reader a mirror that they can relate to. Oh, I have a sister, right? I have a brother, whatever, there's your mirror. That relationship is universal almost in that now. Then give me a picture of something, something really weird. So, um, wrapping up, last thing. Uh, this is a panel, and actually the panel exists on one of the six panels in the exhibit, which you should really go down and see, it's very nice. It's a little table where you can draw comics, and you have actual graphic medicine, graphic novels there. I do it all right. Any other pictures you want me to talk about? All right, now I <laughs> this is a page from one of my favorite books called El Defo. All right? It would be one of my favorite books no matter what, because uh, Cece is an amazing cartoonist. Um, it, it tells a story of, a, of Cece when she was, a Cece Bell, I'm sorry, when she was a little kid and she had to wear a phonic ear. If you go to her website, she actually has the original phonic ear. And it was this device strapped onto her front with leads up into her ears. Right? And um, when she first got the phonic ear, so the build up to this page, she first got the phonic ear, she gets something here. She's out. Uh, and here she is on the playground for the very first time. So um, this story is an intermediate access to a world most of us don't know what it is like to not be able to hear her very well, right? Obviously, she's a great artist, visual, permanent. You could stop and dwell on various emotional states. Pretty happy here. Not, not so much here, right? Uh, we have context for the discussion of this particular situation. It's hard to hear. Um, what I love are, are some of the, 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 um, the visual cues here that we have in play that comics can use. So what, is she really wearing a cape? How would you read this? Right, so we are seeing in the first two panels her internal representation of herself. Do you suppose there are really stars flying all around her feet? It could be lightning bugs, but it's during the day since I'm like, um, So we see this internal representation. She's felt that right? She can hear what people are saying all the way across the room. So what happens? I think that's large enough to read. It's the emotional moment here. participation part is the worst part of the time. Because <laughs> you might say something and everyone's going to think you're stupid. So you definitely just want to be very careful. <laughs> you don't say anything, you don't. Because there are dumb questions. Yes, I'm putting it out. Um, what happens here? Yep. So like she can finally hear, but then like, like with that comes hearing bad things to the person. So one thing is, 
this guy comes up and he says this thing that runs. And, and why is this, why would this be considered bad? I'll throw it out there for anybody. It's different. Yeah, she's different. Right? So I'm not El Defo, I'm just deaf. Right? And Look at, the, look at the graphic between those two monitor panels. What's happening? <laughs> that illusion, that bubble. I just like making that sound. Uh, used to entertain my children, but now they're in high school college. I think it's rude. So, um, <laughs> so we have just words here and some lines to indicate a self-image shift, right? And an emotional shift, uh, right? Uh, a sudden feeling of otherness, right? That virtually anyone can relate to to some degree or another. I, I would argue you don't get this type of stuff if it was a written story. Not that a written story can't be compelling, but there are certain things I think comics can do that stories can't, that text can't. And for me, what was compelling is that I've never been hard of hearing. Hard of seeing, hard of understanding, but never hard of hearing. So that. That's a different world for me. That's the window. But feeling like a weirdo, oh man, that's a mirror right there. Right? And that thing to me is the compelling thing. Now, one last thing I would say is uh, it would be very easy to say, well, that, well, it sort of makes sense, but I don't draw, so blah, blah, blah. That, that may be true. But you know what? There are starving artists that do. And there are people who love to tell stories that could really use some grant money. Just saying we had some <laughs> for outreach. Right? I'm not talking about me, I'm talking for a friend. <laughs> you don't do medicine, you don't do science, it's all collaborative these days. Right? There are no more alchemists sitting alone in their labs. And so when you think about what you do, if you start saying, you know, my ability to communicate this to the world might be kind of important. I should have got some money that. It doesn't have to be you spending two years learning how to draw. It could be you uh, posting something for one of the numerous art students you undoubtedly have who are going to graduate with nothing to do. And the English major student? Uh, that's terrible. That's a whole arts joke that no one finds funny at my school year. Um, the point is that you could employ people with these skills. And if you do, employ them, right? Don't ever say to an artist or writer, this would be great exposure for you. It's not. Uh, great exposure does not pay the rent. Uh, so they, this, I'm, I'm leaving you with this picture. This is my son Max and Jack back when they were cute. And um, <laughs> Max was the artist, Jack was the writer. Uh, and they had a series of comics called um, Super Mixorama. He was a super chemist. The chemistry set on his chest. Highly impractical, but I never <laughs> So um, I hope that the takeaway here is that you sort of see the use of images potentially differently. Uh, I've opened maybe the door to the use of story, and that you might, if you ever decide you want to do that, entertain um, some of the talents you have right here.